thanks for tuning in to this third episode of Talking Tennis, the show that promises to bring you the most relevant and controversial information in the tennis world. As always, we aim to tackle prominent topics head on with the gen general tennis community and utilize a variety of segments to entertain and educate tennis enthusiasts. I'm Mark Gellard, and we're joined here along today with our regular panelists, Mark Slama. Hi, everyone. And Tom Downs. Guys, how are you? And Tom's actually joining us today from China as he's over there working with some WTA players. Um, so we appreciate him being here. Anyway, we're going to jump Thank right in today, into today's segment. And uh, we're going to start off with the hot seat, which features a special uh, guest today, Andre Golubev, who's competing on the ATP Tour and has just finished playing in the French Open in Paris. Andre uh, was born in Russia, but currently represents Kazakhstan and has achieved a career high ranking of 33 in the world and recorded wins over Stan Wawrinka in the 2014 Davis Cup tie and achieved the 2010 ATP Most Improved Player of the Year award. So we appreciate him joining us here today and welcome Andre. Hi guys, hi everyone. How are you Andre? We're just going to start things off today and say thanks a lot for joining us and uh, we wanted to ask you how things went over in, uh, in Paris for you this year. Oh, of course, of course. I'm with you today. We appreciate you having you appreciate you joining us here, Andre. I wanted to see how how did things go for you in Paris the last couple of weeks at the uh, French Open. Uh, thanks, Mark. Uh, so for me, the Paris was uh, uh, was quite normal event. Let's say was I supposed to um, to play main draw, and as I took in the beginning of the year, but the things were not so good. That so I played qualis, but uh, that's not a problem for me. I think the if you play really well on those events, you you pass the qualis and uh, you get in the main draw. And uh, I lost, uh, unfortunately, last round of qualifiers against Luca Vanni, Italian player. He's uh, playing quite good this year. Made the final in São Paulo in ATP event in Brazil. But then I had uh, luck to be a lucky loser. I must say there were uh, three lucky losers. We were five guys on three spots, so it was quite good chance for me. And uh, <laughs> I went in and I played against Robredo and lost in four sets. Well, it's a good effort. Let me ask you, Andre, with the lucky loser, do they do that based on ranking or is that out of a hat? Uh, no, on the slam, they, they toss everyone. So they take uh, four minimum and then uh, maybe five, maybe six. It must be the quantity of lucky loser plus two guys, but always minimum four with the best uh, ranking and then they 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 toss so maybe you lucky maybe not. Okay, I see. So okay, so first four. Okay, and um, we're going to start off here. Mark's got some questions for you to start things well, off. Well, since we're talking about the French Open, did you play doubles when you were there? Yeah, I played doubles as well. Uh, we lost second round, uh, seven six in the third against Herbert Mahout. Uh, good French couple. They played final in Melbourne this year, so it was tough for us. Yeah, and you played with Dennis Isterman, that's right, from Uzbekistan. Yeah, that's right, yeah. Okay, and you guys have played, played well together. So, so what we want to do is everyone that's listening here is obviously interested in your past, and we wanted to kind of get a feel for, you know, how old were you when you started playing? What was your, you know, how did you develop to the player you've become today? Um, and where did you grow up playing? Yeah, well, I started at age of six in my uh, born city, original city, it calls Volsky, close to Volgograd in Russia, and started as, uh, as a hobby. My father brought me to the tennis club, I started to hit some balls, and uh, suddenly, uh, after maybe one, two years, then I started to play local tournaments, small uh, national tournaments. I found that I, were, I was quite good on that, and... Uh, <laughs> Uh, just keep working, keep practicing, and uh, that's how the things are started. Andre, at what age did you uh, did you commit to the sport? Like start training a lot, start having ambition. Say around ten, twelve. Was uh, that still in Russia? Well, it's not exactly the moment. You know, it's the day you say. Well, from this day, I'm like professional, and from yesterday, it's uh, it was only <laughs> hobby. I must say that in Russia. Uh, uh, most of the people who does sport, they, they try to become professional. So it's not like in Europe or US, that, where it's people or kids, they're just playing for fun. Or, or, or every one of us wants to be professional. So uh, I think this is a, a difference be, uh, between um, 
between our part, you know, Eastern European and the rest of the world. So uh, even uh, even in the young, in the, in the younger categories, under ten, under twelve, everybody's already thinking about. Everybody's already thinking. Everybody's already taking the sport very seriously, as opposed to, <laughs> as opposed to Europe or the U.S., where they start more as a, a hobby, yes, a sport. Yes. Okay. Yes. 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 Exactly. All the things around are like that. So the uh, the coaches uh, try to 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 bring them to a higher level, you know. And uh, they do some stuff, maybe not only on court. The parents are really, um, they really wanted to, the, the kids that became professional, you know. All, all things around there, uh, since the beginning, are like that. Right. There are a lot of um, Russian families coming to the U.S. to train. I was wondering, is the, how is the tennis, how is, the comp, how is it competitive over there in the junior tournaments in Russia? Is it? Very competitive, lots of players, easy to find tournaments, easy to find opponents, or, or, well, what, would you, what was your take on it? Yeah, I think it's a good competition, competition, and uh, it's nice uh, sport rivality, you know, uh, between between Russian young players. But unfortunately, unfortunately, many of them they have to stop really earlier because there is not so many chances to to become a professional like a ATP or WTA. That's why. Most of the players are moving somewhere, as you say, to US or to Europe or to somewhere else. Uh, and uh, I must say that we take the sports opportunity to become a tennis player as well as the way to, to get out from, from there, you know, to get out from that situation. Right. That makes sense. Let me ask you, Andre, uh, you know, you, you're obviously Russian. But you now represent Kazakhstan. Can you give us some more information? A lot of people follow you and they ask why you're representing Kazakhstan if you were born in Russia. Can you give us some information on that? Yeah, well, many, uh, many people ask me how is it possible. I say, look, with all former uh, countries, it's always like that. Because when I was born in 87, actually, it was one, one country, still one country, the Soviet Republic. And then uh, when I was age of four, they, they split. And uh, there is uh, nothing illegal to to pass from Russia to Kazakhstan, you know, especially between those countries. They have many agreements, many uh, laws that permit this kind of things. Uh, the same happens with uh, with Yugoslavia, I think. So many, I, I know some players. They they went from Bosnia to represent Croatia or from Serbia to Montenegro and stuff like that. Uh, and obviously, I found that in Kazakhstan was big project of development of tennis so and be part of this huge project uh, uh, I think is a, is a great opportunity for me and of course playing for Davis Cup that, that's right that's a great I mean I was lucky enough to be over there when you were playing and it's it's uh, to represent a country in Davis Cup is a, is a big honor and I know you've had some of your best results there right I mean last year you, you managed to beat Bavrinka in in Switzerland yeah, yeah, definitely. The Davis Cup is always something special, and uh, uh, to have the, to have a chance to to be a part of the team, it's uh, it's great honor. Absolutely. Well, go ahead, Andre. Let's go back to your uh, to your years as a junior. So you yeah. uh, you came to the sport in Russia, but after that, I understand you moved to Italy when you were younger. Did you move there to play tennis, or or uh, did you grow as a tennis player in Italy? Uh, yes, of course, first steps I, I did in Russia, I moved when I was 15 years old, oh, 15, and okay. uh, I've been in the national team, in the Russian national team under 14, so I told, let's say I was already a good player for the junior level, uh, but the things that, uh, if you are not from Moscow, that it's very hard to, to practice there, and even if you are in Moscow, it's, sometimes it's very hard, because you play outdoor only four months a year, and... Uh, in, it's so expensive, and uh, my parents they they want to send me already somewhere in Europe to to find the best uh, possibilities for that. And uh, I was lucky to find uh, this club in Italy, who helped me a lot to to become a professional tennis player. So, what club in Italy is this? Where were you Sorry? in Italy? Where were you in Italy training? Yeah, it's a small tennis club called uh, Matchball Bra. It's close to Turin. And uh, it's private uh, club academy. There were not so many players, only two or three. 
but uh, with good coach and uh, I was obviously lucky to <laughs> to finish in uh, his hands. Yeah, absolutely. You know, Andre, we, we, we're all coaches here, me and Mark and Tom, and one of the things that we run into is, is you know, the junior transition to the pros. How high ranked were you as a pro, uh, uh, sorry, as a junior? And how important do you think that your junior ranking and the tournaments are in terms of becoming a professional player? You know, because a lot of players, they don't know, should they f pursue that career of pro tennis or should they look into college? Yeah, well, uh, in junior, obviously, my best ranking was 100 ATF, under 18. So <laughs> let's say nothing, uh, nothing special, but I, obviously I played only three or four tournaments here close to, to my, my place when I was in Italy and in France. And uh, my coach said that I was already um, ready to play a futures, to start to play futures. And uh, we started uh, at the age of 16 with, uh, with first tournaments. Uh, that, that, that's my case. And I know uh, like if you take top 10 of uh, ITF players in, in the past, you can see, of course, like Federer, Monfils, they were number one. And now they are in the top as well, but you can see as well the, the guys who were in the top three, four, five, and they somebody's top play tennis, somebody's maximum 400, stuff like that. So it's always tough to say. I think uh, you have to see many things. Uh, you need to play uh, juniors, I guess, uh, so you can compete with your uh, with your age. What I think is important, not to to play against already you know monsters like big, big, uh, big boys. Big guys uh, who are 25 or 30, um, and then you can start to see a world. So you can play at least one year, like Grand Slams. You can travel as a as a pro, as a future pro. So maybe you get ready for that. Because I remember when I was traveling first times, I was a little bit uh, not uh, afraid, but um, uh, surprised, you know, of these uh, big events, Melbourne, US Open, French Open, because as a junior, I never played there. And uh, first time, it, it was not easy for me. Of course, yeah. So that's interesting. You would recommend to all the top top junior players to stay a little bit longer in juniors, play those Grand Slams, get that experience, if they have that level. I was going to ask you, Andre, what, how was the transition for you when you went into the, the, the senior game, into the adult game with the, with the pros? Would, would, would that take you, uh, how long did it take you to reach that rhythm? What difficulties did you find uh, transitioning from the junior game to the pro game? Or was it just more of, more of a logical progression? But I think it was a logical one and it was growing up slowly, year by year. You know, I, I didn't have like one year that I went from, let's say, 900 to 100 immediately. No, I was growing up physically, technically and tactically slowly. The finish one year 600, the next year 400 and 300, and uh, uh, somebody can do it in, in in less time. Somebody can do uh, even more time. But the important thing to to grow up and uh, with every um, every points of your tennis, you know, especially now in physical stuff, what is so important to to become a strong player. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, I, I wanted to ask you, Andre. So far in your career, have it, well, first of all, sorry, let me go back. Did you ever look at college tennis as an option, or that never crossed your mind? Yeah, well, you know, uh, when I was 19, I even did know that it was college tennis. But I, I've got a call from the um, one university in Texas, uh, and they asked me if I want to play for them. You know, if I I see these uh, options, but in that moment I, I was fine with my financial situation, and uh, I was already maybe 500 something like that. And uh, of course uh, I said no because you know I'm practicing, I have everything to become a pro uh, pro uh, pro player, so I will stay with that. But in the same time I understand that I know some guys when they have some problem with uh, to playing tennis or to pay for it. For for them is the solution, but I say it's more um, uh, maybe not what they want, but what they have to do in that moment, you know. Of course, yeah, uh, makes sense. Andre, did you have any defining moments in your uh, when you were becoming when you were a young pro? Any moments where you 
like any breakthrough tournaments that they got you higher in ranking, they got you in the top 100 so you could play Grand Slam? Are there any moments or was it just a constant progression until you reached that level? Well, yeah, I remember when I was, 20, when I was at 21, uh, in October I was 150 in, in ranking. And uh, suddenly I went to St. Petersburg. In that moment, uh, it was a uh, big event. Was uh, one million uh, prize money, and uh, in those years they were different. Not two fifty, five hundred, one thousand is like that. So the tournament gave a lot of points. And I remember when I played from Qualis, I went to the final and uh, became top hundred. In uh, and in that moment, like I became, I broke, I I broke this. Um, uh, this crucial level, now it's top hundred for for uh, for the tennis. That tournament, you st you qualified and then went to the finals. Yeah. In Russia, interesting. Yeah. It's a, yeah. a, a very tough level there. I know uh, in Russia, all those guys can play. So that was yeah, definitely a defining moment. And then, um, you know, we, we one of the one of the things I wanted to really talk about, and Tom also is is with us here. He's going to want to know about this as well, but. Can you give us some information then about your typical training regime? You know, how many hours a day growing up and even now are you playing a day on the court? How much are you doing physically? What are you doing nutritionally? All that kind of stuff because, you know, we're trying to build players, but you look at guys like Djokovic now, they're so well-rounded. Their flexibility, their speed, their power, their nutrition, everything is so managed. What's your opinions? What's your schedule like for that kind of stuff? Yeah, sure. As you say, Mark. Now it's everyone is so professional in every in every point of uh, of tennis life, you know. And uh, personally, personally, I say that um, my program, my daily program, was changing during the years. What was absolutely normal when I was more more junior till 20, 21, I was playing much more tennis. So I was doing huge volume of tennis uh, because I, I guess in 20 years old, you can do a lot of work and uh, you have to do a lot of work. And uh, normally I had uh, one physical session a day and two tennis sessions a day. Um, after that, uh, 25, 26 year old, and now I'm doing two physical sessions and one tennis session. Maybe a little bit longer, but one tennis session a day. And uh, I like to start the day in the, in the gym. So to start with the weights, with uh, special exercise I need, then step on in co step on court, uh, make nice tennis uh, session, and afternoon again uh, physical. So when you talk about uh, physical work, what what exactly you're working? You're talking uh, strength and conditioning in the gym. So with the weights, so you do do you do um, a lot of cardio stuff? Do you do uh, interval training? Um, how much time do you spend on flexibility? These are all questions that are interesting for the juniors that might be listening in here. Yeah, well, in the, uh, I like in, in the morning to to manage my weights, you know, to work with the weights. Okay. Uh, and then afternoon, the program is always changing, so it's it's cardio work for sure, uh, flexibility, core stability, a little of those small things. They they are small, but uh, they are really important. Absolutely. And and do you do you? Sh go into a little bit now it's something that interests me a lot is is the nutritional part of of tennis and you know how do you manage that especially with all the traveling that you're doing it's so tough to eat healthy to eat consistently how do you manage that side of the tennis yeah sure you're right and uh for you know, when i'm at home i i can uh uh i can work in a little bit easier as i'm at home uh, I, I get some help from from my parents, for example, but when you travel, it's it's so hard to to eat healthy and the same food when you change continents and uh, and uh, countries uh, maybe two times uh, a month. And uh, of course, I'm uh, helping with some um, nutritional stuff. Like now, I work with the Herbalife products, and uh, they give me what what I need for uh, for. Stay healthy, you know, to to get some vitamins, uh, electrolytes, to to rec recovery after tough practice and matches and stuff like that. Right. Uh, and I, I think it's very important because it's the same 
I always say it's like with the car, you know, you put good good gas in or you put some something bad, you know. And uh, of course, your car going much better if you put uh, very high level of gas inside. And this is the same with our bodies. And I think every player has to develop his program with the nutritional stuff because this is, gives something extra. Because many people, they work in very hard on court physically, but with, with nutritional problem, I think you can give those five, ten percent more what can make a difference. Absolutely. That that small that small difference makes you know, that small adjustment can make a big difference at that high end level of tennis. Exactly, exactly. And and herbal life, they are I know you work with them and I know them, they're a very good brand. Are they approved? you know, by the ATP and all that kind of stuff because you've got all the doping and the drug rules. Uh, you, you have, that's all cleared and that's safe for, for players to take. Yeah, personally, I got tested last year maybe 10 times uh, or maybe even more. And it always was, was okay, it was fine. And uh, yeah, on those products, they, <laughs> they, there's label on, uh, on a date that is no uh, forbidden substance and they... They were tested by by anti drug commission and uh, everything was was perfect. So it's, there is no worries about that. Perfect. That's good to know. Okay. So, uh, the good thing, the good thing, they um, they have a huge variety of products. So uh, for uh, every people, every person, you can make your program. As everybody, everyone is different, and uh, it's good to have something that uh, can adapt to your to your system to your daily schedule so these are these are products that you use mostly for recovery or all types of products well there is everything it's uh, let's say before during and after so all what you need for uh, for your life for your tennis life yeah they have it that's great that's great and uh, Sorry to interrupt. Tom, you had some questions. I know that you wanted to, to, to get to Andre. Yes, Andre, who's your coach currently? Well, now I'm working with the coach Massimo Pucci, who helped me for uh, 10 years. Uh, okay. To Italy, yeah, and uh, <coughs> he's helping me. He cannot travel with me at home, unfortunately, in this moment because he works as well with uh, the junior player Matteo Donati from Italy. Okay. He's currently 200 in rank and he's only 20 years old. And uh, he's working with, uh, with him as well. Uh, but when I'm here in, in Italy to, to practice, he's always with me. And who's the traveling coach? Do you have a traveling coach? Uh, I'm trying with the um, fitness coach right now. Okay. As I said, yeah, because my tennis coach cannot travel. Uh, okay. okay. This year, so I'm I'm uh, I'm taking fitness coach some weeks with me. What is always important to because you have to to be in good shape. Got to maintain it. Yep. Yeah. Absolutely. And you know, Andre, for me, one of the things that I enjoyed talking to you about in the past was, and I think it's something that. Is very interesting. You have, you know, of the of the top players, you've, you, I believe, you've played Federer, you've played Nadal. Have you played Djokovic? Yeah, four times, you, I guess. So you've played all those guys. I think you got him in the first round of the U.S. Open last year. Is that right? Yeah, I got Rafa in uh, in U.S. Open uh, 2011. Okay. Yeah. Those top guys, the Murrays, the the Nadals, the Federers, the guys that are just a little bit above everyone else at the moment. What did you feel when you're playing those guys? I know you played Federer at the, at the uh, Davis Cup. You played Vavrinka and you beat him. What did you no did you notice anything substantially different in terms of what they did? I mean, just for us more regular people, what you know? What do you feel was so impressive about those guys? Yeah, well, uh, first of all, uh, you feel I think more pressure when you step on court against them because uh, you feel like you know you have to make something. Uh, extraordinary to to beat them that feeling i had and uh is not easy but somewhere is not like that it's only feeling because they're human too of course to beat them you have to play i think your best tennis and and they uh have to play not them best tennis uh but the consistency the 
uh, how they sh how solid they play from uh, from baseline from uh, uh, from from the shore from the return it's uh, unbelievable when i went to play against roger once and i remember uh, from the tv i saw him i said ah he's killing every ball you know takes a lot of risk but when i played against him i was surprised how much speed he gives to the ball that's something uh, unrealistic and the ball was o always over two meters over the net, you know, one meter, two meters over the net. And uh, this, of course, gives to him so much security. You know, when he wants, he can finish the ball very easy. But if he wants, he can stay there and uh, play, I think, maybe one hour without missing. So that's the huge difference. And of course, serve, serve and uh, physical, physical preparation. Yeah, that's interesting. And of all the guys you've ever played, is there one guy in particular that you say would be the toughest opponent you've ever played? Is there someone that you really felt was very difficult for you to play? Yeah, for, for me, of course, Feder, because I mean, he served, uh, <coughs> served unbelievable. He doesn't give you any idea where, where he served. First, second, you know, some players, they have your favorite spots. You know that on break point he's gonna surf and there and there, but with him you never know, even on second surf. And that's uh, that, that's really hard to the opponent. And uh, I think against Djokovic, against Djokovic, I, I say they first of all you have to beat the wall, then you can play against Djokovic. <laughs> that, that's the exactly feeling I had when I was on court against him. Just doesn't miss. Yeah. Yeah. That's... Doesn't miss and gets everything back and return and serves everything. That's, uh, that's very interesting. Sorry, go ahead, Mark. Hey, Andre, tell us a little bit about your match against Vavrinka in the Davis Cup last year. That's, that's a match you won. That's got to be one of the big moments of your career, winning against this type of player. And we're, we're taping this as the French Open is going on, and so he's in the finals playing, he won already. playing Djokovic. He won. So he won already. He won already? <laughs> oh, okay. That's interesting. So that will be our, our discussion on the next... Uh, but so tell us a little bit about that match. So you've just beaten, you've beaten the guy that's now won the French Open. Tell us about that match and how it was. Yeah, uh, well, it, it was really close match, what is normally when you play against those guys. And I won two tiebreaks because he's on serve sometimes unplayable. And tiebreak, you know, you, you, uh, two points can change everything. And uh, I was so much focused on, on my game. Because he likes, uh, I think, to have some time on the ball, you know, because he's, uh, he has huge strokes with uh, large uh, open uh, sense and uh, stuff like that. And I was playing quite fast that, uh, to get away that, that rhythm from him. And uh, What surface were you playing the match on? It was indoor hard. Indoor hard. It was indoor, like normal, not really fast, normal average hard, like in US on, or okay. somewhere else. And I was going quite uh, a lot to the net to to finish the point. Uh, that was my my key, and of course I have to play very good on that level without uh, missing maybe one game or go some, somewhere with my concentration. So uh, basically, so you're so trying to take it went good. Yeah. Trying to take time away from him, which brings us to the next question, the, the next general topic that we wanted to talk about. Have you, you said you came to the net a lot in that match to finish your points. Have you seen any difference in the, in the years that you've been on the tour and the evolution of the style of play? Uh, I know as watching the top players, we see a lot of the same style, like heavy baseline hitting, fast playing from the baseline, a little less players coming into the net than, than used to be 15 years ago. What's your take on it being, in the, being on the circuit and playing uh, at this high level? Yeah, that's uh, for sure. In the last ten years, the uh, uh, the tennis uh, changed a lot, and I think now it's not so big difference between clay and hard courts. It was before it was okay hard court. You mean that it's fast? The guys who surf quite well, they they get advantage. Now it's not not like that. Everybody's strong. Everybody from baseline. Everybody who hits hard. Uh, they can they can win uh, a lot. Uh, there is no people anymore goes to the net. Uh, well, and I think there you can uh, uh, you can still learn a lot because 
everybody's playing, playing from the baseline, everybody hits hard, but some people, uh, some players, they're not going to the net to finish the points, you know, they prefer to wait maybe for the right ball, and they have some time for that. So I think there is uh, there is some limit still for, for players and uh, who can learn to, to get the net faster when they have to go, of course. It would be good advantage. Yeah, Andre, one of the things that I feel is, is going to happen is that tennis goes in cycles. And I think that when you watch guys like Djokovic and Murray and Nadal, I don't know how much more room there is for improvement on the baseline. So I think that in order, you know, the next generation has got to start getting be better at transitioning, taking time away from the opponents a little bit and moving back towards the net again. Do you agree with that? I think so. You know, it, it's a good question. And... Uh, uh, when you were telling this, I remember the match of Federer against uh, Djokovic in Shanghai, fi Shanghai final. And who does uh, what? Uh, what sorry, the Federer does to beat Djokovic? He goes to the net almost every point because he knows that from baseline he has no chances. But at least when he's attacking, he he's more uh, aggressive on court. Uh, they, they he he still has uh, many chances. And. Uh, I think the key is there, of course. When you play against normal guys, maybe it's enough to stay back. But uh, anyway, it's just something more for your game. So I think doesn't not, doesn't not mean if you make 50 winners of forehand, you should stay back all the time, and uh, because you know your forehand is so great. Because can you imagine that when you playing solid from baseline, and then as well coming to the net? The opponent will, will get crazy. He will say, well, so what I have to do to beat him? Exactly. Andre, we, we grew up seeing uh, different styles going through tennis. We saw, uh, we saw number ones like Ivan Lendl, who played mostly from the baseline, and then Stefan Edberg, who came to the net. Do you think that today, a player who came in who had a very oriented attacking game, who would serve and volley, who would follow the returns on second serves to the net, do you think that a player like that would have a chance today, given the fact that uh, the top players are probably difficult to beat like that, but what about the players who are 200, 300? Do you think this style of play would still be effective? And Are you seeing any of that with the juniors you're trained with or, or the, the juniors you see or, or, the, or the young aspiring pros or the top pros? Mm. Uh, yeah, sure. When, when I see now the young guys and uh, unfortunately, the young players now, they're playing, uh, they taking the style of Djokovic, of Murray, I would say. They always try to to fight, to, to play from the baseline. They don't develop so much the, the aggressive style of player. And I don't know how it's going to be in the future, you know, because uh, it's tough to say now. And uh, But of course, tennis is changeable. I think in 10 years, we will see something different for sure. Because otherwise, uh, it's not possible otherwise. No, absolutely. In my opinion, what happened is a lot of players really developed the baseline, the passing shot skills, because they were confronted to that with players like uh, Edberg, or Sampras. So th those top players developed those skills. They're not really being confronted to players coming to the net anymore. And if players develop that skill anymore, it may be... It may be a new skill that players in the future don't have. They won't know how to handle players who come in on them all the time. Yeah, and also, I mean, Andre, you're, you're, you've, got, you've had a lot of success in doubles. I mean, what's your doubles ranking right now? Yeah, uh, right now I'm 60, 69. We, we drop a little bit after Ron Garros. We was last year I played semis in, uh, in Paris. Uh, so I will be like around 100, maybe 100 something. What's been your career high ranking in doubles? In doubles, I think this one's 60, 65. Okay. And, you, and you, I mean, obviously your volleys are great, so playing doubles has probably helped your, your singles as well, in a way? Yeah, for sure. Many singles players are taking doubles now. Uh, before, we were taking doubles as, a, as a, let's say, something like extra practice for serve returns and volleys. Now it's become more serious because you see a lot of singles players playing doubles. And uh, the level of doubles is higher than years before. Uh, and of course, it, it helps a lot in, as well for singles. Yeah, absolutely. I, I agree. And that's a, something I think the juniors need to do more of when they're playing. Yeah, and by, by the way, you know what I'm thinking for the, for the future, you know? Uh, 
uh, I think in the future very important is gonna be how technically are players on high level or not because now the first important thing you have to you have to to be a strong physically sometimes you see the people who are very strong they they're not great with the technique but it's not possible to make a point to them you know <coughs> but when you when you <coughs> to learn to play tennis like the, play in real sen sense of the war so you know like feather you know that he can do some slice in the middle he can do drop shot spin there that makes uh, really hard work for for other for other one and uh, i think that will be the key for the su success as well in the future yeah and uh, the tech yeah. Tech, it's so important uh, for, to play tennis so, Andre, if you had some uh, advice to give to a junior player who's uh, 15 or 16, what would you tell him to focus on? Would you, I mean, what, would, what advice would you give him in terms of progression? Like what you just said, make, make sure that your technique is solid at a high level, that your fitness is strong. What, what, what advice would you give a young player who wants to reach the highest levels? Yeah, of course, they have to be focused on every uh, point of the tennis life, you know. Now it's tennis so much professional. It's not a hobby. It's real, real work and hard work. And uh, you have to work every day on your technique of your physical uh, stuff uh, to follow up your, your nutritional plan and uh, develop together with the coach that uh, day after day, week after week, and uh, they learn from the big champion as, as we have in, uh, in top level guys now. Uh, Andre, before we before we wrap this up, I wanted to ask you one question here because we've got a lot of people listening from our recreational players, college players, junior players. What role should the parents play in terms of the of a player's development? I mean, you've experienced it, and your parents ha handled it in a certain way. Everyone's parents are different, but if you had an ideal scenario, what do you think would be a what do you think is the role of the parents? when their child is trying to make it professionally? Yeah, I know the parents is, uh, is very important. They have to support the kid, support, uh, support mentally and psychology, but not don't overtake that, that, that place. You know, sometimes it happens that the parents, they go over that. They, they start to be a, a coaches, let's say. Uh, and uh, I think it's, it's not possible to happen because you're the coach you do your job and the parents they they have to be really close to the kid they have to be always supporting but uh, not overtake that that's that's good advice i think that's important that everyone on the for, team has a defined role for us who yeah. work as coaches in um in the, in with with juniors what you're saying is very important to us make sure that every role is defined and the parents role is an important one but it's a different one than the coach's role Exactly. That, that, I think that's normal when a coaches they have to speak with the parents and parents say no, but you know they, they, they say this opinion. But I think it has to be uh, only with the coach. You know, uh, the player, the kid, he da he he has to be out of that situation. You know, you know he has to see the parents only uh, uh, the the person who gives him a lot of support from. Um, the heart, you know, from the family is come on, you can do it, you you can become a great great tennis player, you can do this job. Uh, so only, only, only positive things, only positive things that like keep going and uh, don't uh, don't overtake this this, uh, this role, you know. No, absolutely. And sorry, go ahead. I, I just wanted to ask before we go again, Andre. What's so? What's your plan now? What are you up to? What are your, you know, I know you've, you've finished the French, taking a bit of time off now and then preparing for either, you know, I know you're not a big fan of the grass court. So what's your tournament schedule and, and plans for the next couple of months? Yeah, uh, I will not be a part of uh, the grass season this year, uh, <laughs> Wimbledon including, because I have a little bit uh, of a uh, physical problem that I, is not serious, but, but I want to be sure. As you said, that I'm not really a fan of the grass, so I can do that during the grass tournaments. Uh, and then I will have a Davis Cup tie, 
the quarter final of World Group, uh, we play away in Australia. Uh, that's the important date for us in the uh, third weekend of the July. And after that, we start with the normal hard season before uh, before US Open. That's great. So, um, you know, I, I think, uh, Andre, you've been so helpful for us and to everyone listening. And um, we really appreciate you giving us uh, your time today. Yeah, thank you, Andre, for coming on. This is very thanks, nice. Andre. Thanks, guys. It was a pleasure. Andre, thanks so much. Have a great time and good luck in your upcoming tournaments. Thank you. Thank you, guys. I want to push on now into the final part of our episode today, which is our favorite section, which is good call, bad call. And uh, as always in this section, we're going to talk about some hot topics in tennis. And um, what we wanted to start off with today is something that um, has become quite uh, relevant on social media. Um, And... um, We've all noticed that, <clears throat> sorry, that Serena has dominated women's tennis for the last, say, decade or so. She's just getting better and better. And, uh, you know, her tennis speaks for itself. However, something that's come up here with the French Open has been her on-court behavior. And as of yesterday, after she, she had a, a tough match in the semis against Paczynski, she was very theatrical. I will say, in her match against Tamiya Baczynski. And at one point, sat down and asked the umpire what the score was in a, in a way that was seemingly, she was almost so out of it, she had lost count of the score. This is not the first time we've seen this behavior from her. Last year, I believe it was at Wimbledon, we had a kind of hitting serves into the ground before the net, kind of falling over, struggling to keep herself up. Now. We're not there. We don't know. We can only speculate. But with all her behavior and and charades this this last few days at the French Open, and she has won the tournament, Tara Moore, uh, relatively well-known English female player, made a comment on Twitter that said, not only is Serena one of the best women players of all time, she's also one of the best actresses. Hashtag suck it up, hashtag learn how to lose, hashtag pathetic. Now, this was responded to by Laura Robson, a more well-known British player, and she replied to Tara Moore and said, I'm not convinced the pathetic hashtag can apply to one of the best players of all time, hashtag 19 slams. So this has started a debate. I have an opinion. For me, I'm going to jump right into this now and say I think her behavior is totally unacceptable. She's a role model. She has a responsibility to all the young kids growing up. I think it's poor sportsmanship. I've had the flu. I've been sick. I've never had a problem, though, remembering something like she has there. It's absolutely ridiculous. She's, she's using her, her position and power in the sport to, to, to pull off these kinds of theatrics, which are just unnecessary, uncalled for, And we don't really see them in the men's side as much. I mean, a few years back, you could look at a guy like Djokovic. He, he was also, you know, utilizing the trainer and the on-court timeouts a lot. I am so tired of watching Serena and the way she behaves. I mean, if you go back for the last 10 years, you could make a 20-minute highlight reel of the ridiculous stuff that she's been treated for and the drama that she always wants to create around her match. So going back to the start of this, Tara Moore... Good call or bad call on her tweet there. Absolutely great call, Tara. Love that you came out there and said it. Big respect. Mark, on to you. I'm going to agree with you uh, and with Tara. Good call. The, this, for me, raises two things. One is, uh, the first thing is, we, we work as coaches with junior players. And I can honestly say, if I had a junior player that behaved like that in a tournament, I would, either, I would pull her out or I would leave. I wouldn't watch this kind of attitude. This comes up, players are sick, players have some kind of, some kind of pain somewhere. If they decide to play, then they, they decide to play. They don't put on a show like, oh, look at me, I'm struggling. It's something that we have to deal with every day, and it's something that, for me, hinges on respect towards the other player, towards the fans, towards, towards the sport in general. So for me, this hurts our sport. And the second thing is that I want to talk about the, the hashtag by Laura, but the, the tweet by Laura Robson, because for me, this raises another problem, is Serena's the greatest female tennis player in history, in my opinion, in terms of results. But does that mean that she can't be criticized? 
This has nothing to do with her results. We're talking about attitude. She's won 20 grand slams, fantastic. But this doesn't mean that we can't say anything about it. And that we, and th I have a problem with this because since the French Open has been finished in the media, no one's uh, talking about this. No one's uh, bringing this up as a problem. But if it was another player d acting this way, I think we'd be reading more about it. And uh, I think that she's getting away with so much because she's protected by the WTA. She's protected by, you know, the media and all of this because of her status. But at some point, this is just embarrassing for our sport. I mean, it really is embarrassing. It's making a mockery of it's of the whole setup. It's hurting us as junior coaches. Absolutely. Players Mike. see this kind of behavior and they think that it's acceptable. It, so, so, yeah, absolutely. Tom, let's pass it over to you. Good call or bad call on behalf of Tara Moore. On behalf of Tara Moore, I'm going to say it is a bad call. And I'm not saying that, you know, in a bad way towards Tara. Everybody is entitled to have an opinion. So if Tara wants to voice it, that's fine. Um, I mean, if I'm ranked 400, which is where Tara's ranked, I'm probably going to keep quiet because... Why draw attention, you know, towards myself? What's the point of doing that? I mean, it's England. It's my home country. The grass court season is coming up. At, or I should say it's just started. Um, she's going to be hounded for questions, you know, about this. I mean, if I'm Tara Moore, I'm probably just going to keep quiet and play tennis. But that's just me. But then again, look, people are entitled to their opinions. Um, I think Serena is an entertainer. I think ten, you know, I think she's good for tennis. Um, you know, so often we hear, the, you know, you know, we hear, um, you know, we hear a fair bit about Serena. We hear the state of the ladies' game being, you know, criticised. You know, I think she's good for tennis. She's mentally tough. Perhaps the pressure got to her a bit. Um, Maybe it's gamesmanship, you know, from her end, but look, you know... Um, I mean, I believe as well that she uses it as a defence mechanism and it's a, a way for her to almost distract herself. Sure she distracts is. herself with an injury or something and it takes her attention away from the, the task in hand, which is somewhat overwhelming sometimes. I understand that. I think everyone's done that to a degree, but to a degree. And she uses this time and time again and it's just not fair to the opponents. And I know what you're saying about Tara Moore being ranked low with the grass court season coming up. But again, going back to what Mark said, I don't, I don't have a ranking on the ATP tour, but I've got a very strong opinion about the way Serena's behaving. I don't think that, you know, she's a professional player, Tara Moore. She's making it a go of it. I think she's entitled to, to say what she said. Because Absolutely she is. But, you know, again, I just think it brings, you know, attention to her, which is probably... Not a great thing. I mean, if you're ranked around 400 and you're criticising arguably the greatest player of all time, or should I say you're voicing an opinion which is not positive about the greatest player of all time, well, you know, I, I, you know look, I mean, if I'm in her shoes, I'm not going to do that. Okay. I'm, I'm just not going to do it. Um, you know, in terms of Serena, yeah, she's an actress. You know, she's an entertainer. Is what she does any worse than you know, a McEnroe or a Jimmy Connors or a Nastasi. No, it's not. I mean, she, she's not even close to being as bad as those guys. But in this day and age... Um, well, she's going to be you know, open to more criticism and, and social media players can yeah, now... Yeah, you know, I mean, there's more things involved. It's a different time. Um, could she do a better job, Serena? Yes. Does the pressure, obviously get to her sometimes, yes. Is it gamesmanship, you know, from her end, yes. Does she want to win badly, yes. Um, no, I, does I, it give the other girls an easy excuse? Well, maybe. But, no. you know, look, at the end of the day, she wins matches, she, you know, she wins titles, she is the greatest ever. Um, no, I agree with what you're saying. Well, let's push on to the next, um, the next topic in this one, which is going to be somewhat controversial, as we always like to make it. Um, a, lot of, a lot of people have spoken to me about this, and I wanted to bring this up anyway. The Power Share Series is, uh, is a tour for legends of the game, the McEnroe's, Philippoussis, Courier, 
uh, Ivanisevic, you get a lot of these guys playing these tournaments. And they're, they're nice tournaments. They're held all over the country, all over the world. I know that they have one at the Royal Albert Hall in England usually once a year. Recently, yeah. they signed a deal with Comcast Sports Network, CSN, and Fox Sports Network, FSN, as well as the Tennis Channel. And they're showing a lot of this tennis. And it's on a lot of the time in prime time in Tennis Channel and on the CSN and FSN. Do we want to be seeing this kind of tennis anymore? So in this, my question is, PowerShare Series signing a contract with CSN, FSN and the Tennis Channel. Is that a good call or a bad call? Mark, let's start with you. I'm going to go ahead and say that that's a terrible call, in my opinion. Uh, I have personally no interest in watching old, I mean, uh, players from the past playing because their level of tennis is not the same. The, the motivation, the investment they put in the game is not the same. And for me, this dilutes from, from our sport in general because people go, go to, de to, to watch these matches to see something that's just entertainment, no more a sport. Just to see, they want to see McEnroe a little bit. They want to see players. And I actually saw a little bit of these matches at the French Open between the legends. And after, after watching uh, a match from the, from the main draw, you watch this and you change, the, change it after 30 seconds. I have no interest in this. I don't think it's good for the sport. I think it's good for the sport to remember the, the players that made the sport and show, show them when they were in their prime. I, I, mean, I, I mean, this, you know, on the PowerShare website, they, they state that they have champions such as Andre Agassi, Pete Sampras, Andy Roddick, John McEnroe, Jim Courier, Michael Chang, James Blake, and Mark Filipousis. And those are all fantastic players. It's a 12-city tour of one-night tournaments in, that is played in major arenas. And each tournament features four champions paired off in one set semifinals and culminates with the winners meeting in a one-set championship match. Tom, good call, bad call? I think it's a good call. I think it's a very good call. Eh? Um, you know, look, I mean, tennis is about entertainment again. Um, I think that, you know, it's, today's game is not appealing to everyone. You know, the older generation that enjoyed watching different styles of players, both, both people can enjoy watching these older guys play. Uh, I, I also think it's good for the young kids to watch these guys play because they're playing all-court tennis. We get Philip Hussis, who's serving bowling. We get Chang, who's, you know, kind of like an aggressive counter-puncher with interjections and all-court play. We get Courier. Um, Tom, are you talking about them now or are you talking about them when they played? No, I'm talking about it now. I think it's good, you know, for the young kids to be able to watch the older guys still play. I, I think it's still a good caliber of tennis mark what would be your opinion on this i'm gonna i'm gonna go out and say it's a it's a bad call and i'll tell you why when i turn on that power shared series tennis first thing i notice is they're playing in a stadium that holds twenty thousand, and there's only a thousand to fifteen hundred people there the second thing i feel is i don't see this in any other sport maybe i'm wrong but i don't often turn on the tv and see espn showing a game between the the heroes of the NBA from the 80s and the 90s, or the <coughs> baseball guys. Well, we see a champions Three golf tour. Players. We see a champions we golf tour that is on the that is on TV on the Golf Channel, usually primarily on the Golf Channel. I agree. I think they should get rid of that as well. I mean, I think that's I think it's somewhat sad that that's taking up our our tennis t TV time because t tennis doesn't receive a lot of of coverage as it is. To put this stuff on there, I mean, look, these guys have played good tennis. They were great in their prime. I don't want to see this on TV anymore. It's Well, irrelevant. for me, if they were 50 or 60 years old, with the exception of, you know, a Connors or a McEnroe, I'd say, look, that's too old. But, you know, we get Chang and Agassi. If they're in their late 30s and early 40s, we get Sampras, we get Rafter. If they were older than, say, 45 or 50, with the exceptions of a McEnroe or Connors, I'd say, look, it's a bad idea. But watching these guys play, you know, for older... You know, uh, but the other day, I'm, I'm turning it on, I'm watching Andy Roddick in the PowerShare series. I mean, there's guys his age or older still playing on the main tour. I don't want to see a diluted Andy Roddick who 
hasn't hit the ball or is hitting once a week to to keep his paycheck coming in when he needs it and keep himself feeling like he's still important in the tennis world. If he wants to do something in tennis, get out there and start coaching or do something relevant. I don't well, see how him playing an old man's match. Well, I, I wouldn't. I would. I wouldn't blame Andy Roddick for it. For him, it's an opportunity. I really blame the networks for showing this and the tournaments for showing this. If Andy Roddick can make money off of this, why not for him? However, 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 I agree with Mark in the sense that I don't think this helps tennis. The, these guys aren't in their prime. They're not playing their best tennis. They're, I mean, and they're, I, they're well, just, said, they're said. just not showing. If you want to, it would be much more interesting to show a, show the finals of the 1989 Wimbledon finals between these guys when they were at their prime, and you would really Absolutely. learn from that. You, you learn nothing from seeing them play today. Uh, it's just sad. I feel sad for them watching some of this stuff. I mean, it's, uh, <laughs> it's borderline. Pathetic, I think is the word. Hashtag pathetic in Tara Moore's words. So, well, um, I mean, if we, you know, look, I mean, tennis is how all How can you criticize Grand Slam champions? So, so as a product, <laughs> you know, I think that if we want to make the power shares less popular, tennis has to come up with something better than that besides, Well, they've you know, got the, the world team tennis, and athletes. I think we should do away with that as well. I think it's an embarrassment to the sport. I mean, it's ridiculous. Do away with what? With world team tennis, I think that's a joke as well. But that is a joke. You know, it's on the TV. People are watching it somehow. But I just think that if we're trying to make this a mainstream sport, especially in the U.S., that can compete with American football, baseball, basketball, these kinds of sports, hockey. I mean, we just, you know, I think poker gets more coverage on the TV than tennis. Well, does. But, yeah, okay, but you know, again, look, the only reason I like watching the power shares is, is because we actually see a, a contrast in styles, you know, we, I mean, yeah, there's, you know, it's great to watch a Murray and a Djokovic final, it's, it's, it's good to watch all that stuff, yes, but we, but we do have to think, right, you know, these guys are not going to get so much better from the baseline, so pretty mm. well, I, I can tell what I can, but what I can tell you, Tom, is if you want to watch a contrast in styles, Come and watch me and Mark play a practice set this weekend and you'll see some pretty contrasting styles and they'll both be bad. So uh, well, Basically, I'm going to agree with Mark. When you, when you want to watch something, when you pay for something, you want to see the best in the world. Absolutely. Or you want to see aspiring people who are going to be the best in the world. You don't want to see people who, are, who were the best in the world and are just putting on a show. Those are people that you'd be interested in talking to and seeing a show where they would explain, go through what happened to them, go through their... Their, how, the, how their career went, that's, that would be interesting. But watching them play beyond their playing years, no, for I, me, it, I agree, it's pathetic. I, I, I just don't think it. And, uh, you know, what I want to do here is move on to our final topic. And actually, Mark, I wanted to call you out before we moved on. You, in our, in our first episode here, um, you said that uh, Bouchard needed time uh, before we can really say if it was a good call or bad call, departing or, or ending her relationship with Nick Saviano. We're now another month or more on from our first podcast. She has not changed anything so far. Are you still of the same opinion? I mean, she, I, I, I should have, should know this, but I believe she lost again. Yeah, Christina Mladenovic in the first round. She lost in the first round of this most recent slam here. You know, I, I don't see it changing for a mark, and you've said you've asked for for a time. What do you think now? I think you made a bad call. Well, I'm going to go ahead and and stand by my call. I think that she's we, we still need to give this time. I actually I watched that I watched that match. She played against Mladenovic, who's 30 in the world, who put who put on a great performance. And it, can't it, be she cannot be losing to Mladenovic. So there's just no way. Not at her mm -hmm. level. I don't care. What just happened to her? She could be on her deathbed. She should still be beating Medenovic. Well, I'm, I disagree with you. And, and for me, uh, if you look at this level of tennis, if you look at this level of tennis, you know, it, it happens in, in details and in little, uh, in little moments. We're coaches. We know how long it takes to make changes. Maybe, uh, maybe these changes are going to take her to a whole different level. And I'd say we still need to give it time. I'm not as catastrophic on the results as everybody else is. Well, yeah. Well, is this Jeannie? This is Jeannie. Well, you know, Mark, Mark made the call, Tom, you know, back uh, a month or so ago about Jeannie needing more time. Well, here we are four, five, six weeks on from that. She's still not, you know, she's losing to Medenovic first round of the French. That's sad. 
Well, it's a tough first round draw, yes, but it's very sad also. I think she needs to go back to Saviano. I said it for last time, you know, we, we spoke about it. You know, it's time to go back to what was working. It's time to get a coach that works for you, that works good for you. Right. Um, and if you can't get a Saviano back, get, get somebody who works under Saviano. What? Get him to be a consultant. But, you know, I, I know what you're saying as well. Medenovic, okay, she's French, first round. But, I mean, i got to tell you, that's, for me, that's one of the... One, I mean, there's not many better draws than that for a first round. She's an accomplished player. Well, you look player. at it, Mark, and that's... She's that's, top 30 in the world. Right, she's, uh, if I'm Jeannie, I'm going to take a look at She's 22 years old and she's like, developing. Look, I wouldn't discard her. I've got a good her. opportunity here against a, a decent player, player to go out and make a statement that says, I'm back. I'm going to go out there on, you know, Chartrier... I'm going to get a straight set win, and I'm going to send a message, you know, to the rest of the field that says I'm back. I mean, I, that's what I'm thinking if I'm Jeannie, but I, I guess the confidence I, is so low. I think we should uh, let's give lines. this more time and so talk about this after Serbia. after Wimbledon, you'd after like the grass to, season. You'd like to start, and I'm not taking anything away from Adenovic. I do want to point out, I know she's a great player, but I don't think that Jeannie Bouchard should be losing to her on any surface at any time. Having said that, I also said that when Tiger Woods won his first uh, major tournament, that was a one-shot wonder and that Federer was finished three years ago. So, you know, who, who listens to me anyway? Um, so let's move it on to the, to, the, to, the final, to the final point here, you know, with that being said, um, on, on, on the good call, bad call. Um, we've, we've gone into that. Wanted to ask you guys, been watching a lot of the French Open, they're using a different camera angle for a lot of the matches for a few points. And that angle is almost directly behind the player at court eye level. And I think this is such a great way to watch a match on TV because it gives you so much more perspective of what's happening. And I think that the networks need to get together and either you know, offer this as an option so that you can select your view or make this more of a mainstream, because I understand you're going to lose some perspective being up high, but if you go buy tickets for a regular tournament, you're going to be sitting at court level, unless you're at the US Those Open. Those are the most expensive tickets. Exactly. And then if, unless you're at the US Open sitting at the top of the, the stadium at Arthur Ashe, where basically is the view that we get from most tennis matches, sitting behind the court and watching Djokovic, watching how, how high his net clearance is, watching the timing of his split step, watching the depth of the ball, the speed of the ball, the reaction speed, you get such a better, crisper feel for that when they use that different camera level. I think that they need to sort of use that one a lot more. And I would be encouraging ESPN, Tennis Channel, to really be the pioneers here and start offering that as an option or bring in whole matches to us from that level and at least see what the feedback is. Tom, start with you. Good call, bad call on that. I think it's a good call. What's, what's, your, what's your thought? Why do you think that's a good call? Well, I think, you know, people, you know, at all stages of the game who play tennis, they, they like to see the trajectory of shots that the players are hitting as accurately as possible. So from that high angle view... Sometimes it's hard to work out how much arc, you know, Federer gets or how much net clearance Rafa is getting. Um, you know, so I, I just think those things are important, you know, for spectators to be able to see, you know, as, as often as possible. I agree. I, I think this, is, this would be a, a, a big way that tennis can be more interesting. It's also a good coaching tool for us as well. Excellent coaching isn't it? tool. You know, it's, it's nice to be able to say to a student, look, I want you to go home and watch Federer's forehand. Look at how much, you know, sh net clearance he's getting. Well, look depth. at, you know, the RPMs on, on each ball, the shape of the ball, the amount of top spin he's hitting with. Even when he hits a winner, check out his, you know, his margins. No, absolutely. Mark, what's your thoughts on that? I'm going to go ahead and say it's a bad call if it's, that's the only option to watch the game. Because if you, uh, you guys are talking as coaches, as specialists, who look for certain things when you go, to, when you go see a match. If you're looking at the general public, uh, they still need to have the option that they're used to in order to alienate all these players who are used to watching it from a distance. Now, I agree. If I go to a tournament 
I'm going to try to be close to the court so I can see all these things, so I can see the speed. And even if you take someone with you and they get close to the court, they see the players up close, they see the speed of the footwork, they see the speed of the ball. That's something that you don't get to see on TV. However, it's also interesting to know that there's a difference between going to the stadium and watching on TV. And you maybe want to keep that difference alive. So I'm going to say it's a bad call if that's the only thing you're offering. Well, I think I, I think it's certainly something that we can come back to in the future. But I think I, th you know, like I said, I think you you go to any event, whether it's hockey, baseball, basketball, whether you're a coach, a fan, an ex-player, whatever your your uh, association with that sport is, you want you want to be courtside. You want those front row tickets that are going for five hundred bucks in the in the Stanley Cup Finals. You know, you don't want to be up at the top where people at home are going to be getting their angle from. Because you're down there, you feel the action, you feel the energy, the intensity. You know, I just I think we, we would all learn a lot more from it. But you know, let's let's you know write to ESPN and see what they say. Anyone got any connections at ESPN or NBC? Unfortunately, no. No, Tom, you got any connections? Just Renee Stubbs at Tennis Channel. There we go. Sometimes get that works for ESPN. Get that message over to her and make sure we uh, we get some credit for it if it comes into play. Well, I'm hoping to get Stubbsy on here soon, mate. I Absolutely. That'll be she, good, sir. So, She'll yeah. be a great guest. Well, guys, thanks again, as always, for listening, and we appreciate you uh, you tuning in to this third episode of Talking Tennis. I'd like to say thanks, and uh, uh, we appreciate you coming back and pass it over to Mark here. Yeah, thanks, thanks for listening in. Uh, thanks to Andre for a great interview, and thanks, Tom, for staying up late with us and talking to us from China. Always a pleasure, guys. Thanks for having me, as always. It's Tom, Tom, thanks a lot. Have a good one. Thanks again, guys.